Hey everyone, just wanted to jump in and let you know that today's episode might be a good one to preview before listening to with children. We talk pretty openly about topics such as personal health and exploration that might be challenging to some. Just wanted to give you a heads up before we got started. Moving to a new country can be a time of rapid personal growth. It can come in many forms like expanded horizons, new languages, relationship growth, and more. But in the spirit of leaving no topic off the table, today I want to talk about our erotic lives. I think it is an important part of life in general and how we view these things may change more rapidly while living internationally, especially if you move somewhere that is very different than where you grew up or if you meet people on your journey that give you new perspectives. This is exactly what happened to our guest today. Eden Chang met her other co-founders, Winksy, Dina, and Simona, while they were all living abroad. The four besties and children of first-generation Asian immigrants were all raised with a conservative Chinese heritage, where the topics of sex, intimacy, and sex education are still considered taboo. Soon after they met, they discovered they were not the only ones who shared this experience. After creating a community of women from around the world who were sharing their stories openly, they realized there was a massive problem in the sexual wellness industry worldwide. And so they started the O Collective to create products and community centered on women's pleasure. Their belief is that sexual wellness is crucial to our overall well-being, and I could not agree more. I love this conversation so much. The O Collective is a company with a story at the intersection of the power of living internationally, blazing new trails, and wellness for women and girls. Needless to say, I love what they are up to, and I wanted to bring it to the House of Peregrine community. They are truly living their vision of empowering and educating vulva owners globally. As part of their mission, they contribute part of each sale to Free a Girl, whose mission is to rescue and rehabilitate young girls who have been forced into prostitution. The women of the O Collective are truly changing the industry, and I am so excited to bring their story to you today. Also, don't forget to follow the podcast and rate it if you love what we are doing. This is the easiest way to help bring the House of Peregrine podcast to more people. If you want to go deeper and you are living in Amsterdam, you can join our membership at houseofperegrine.com. As a member, you get a smart membership with exclusive artwork from Amsterdam's own Laser 314 and access to events, exclusive products, and a community of people who are living internationally. Okay. On to the episode. Hello, Eden. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so happy to have you on the House of Peregrine podcast. Thank you for having us. Yes. So I want to jump right in and talk about your company, The O Collective. Um, I really am interested first in how you guys got started. What's your origin story? Yeah. So the O Collective is founded by myself, along with three other best friends, Diana, Wingsy, and Simona. And we're a sexual wellness brand. Uh, When we first started out, it really was just very genuine uh, due to our lack of pleasurable sex. And we were living as expats in Shanghai with lots of busy work, busy social life, busy exploring the new country we're living in and the city we're living in. You know, when you're busy, the first thing you tend to give up um, is actually your sexual pleasure. Um, And when the four of us got together post-work, we were expats working at Nike in China. We would get together after Wednesday work days for girls night. And after a few glasses of wine, the topic we always get to is always about the terrible sex we were having. And from there on, we started doing more research and we found out that there is a massive orgasm gap when it comes to men and female pleasure. And we saw the gasping number of 85% of women do not orgasm during penetrative sex. And we were in our mid late twenties at that time. And for us, we were like, wait, how come we did not know about this? And no one has told us about this. And so we dug deeper and did more, did more research and asked our community. We asked about 200 women and we saw the result of over 64% of women really wanted to change their sex lives and make it better, but they didn't know how to do so. 
So then we saw the opportunity. We were like, hey, there are so many people like us. We should be able to help them change what sex is like for them as yeah. we're doing with ourselves. So when you, the four of you just started, it came from you four just like being kind of open and more like candid with each other. Do you think that that came, that natural like wonder came a little bit from living in a different country where you're already kind of open to new experiences? Or do you think, I always think that's kind of a, a trait of international people, but what do you think? I definitely think that contributes to it. So the four of us, what's also interesting is we are all of Asian heritage. And so with growing up in oftentimes stereotypical Asian households is that you have very conservative and strict parents. So in terms of the topic of sex, no one talks about it. And in school, I also grew up half of my life in Asia. School doesn't really teach you about pleasure. School teaches you about not to get pregnant and sex is about procreation. And from media, it's all about pleasuring the other sex. Mm-hmm. And it is actually partially our experience out West, uh, me studying in Canada, Diana studying the US as well, Simona and Wingsy in the Netherlands, that we also have a hint of Western education and Western media that gave us more exposure to what sex can also be. And so combining the both, Uh, we do feel like it gave us more exposure to the potential of the pleasure of sex, I would say. Yeah. And so you feel like that was growing up in your, what you would call conservative, um, traditional Chinese or Asian backgrounds. The funny thing is I would say the same thing about living in the U.S., but I grew up in a very conservative place. Mm. And so it's so interesting that you, that combination helped you. So when you lived outside your country, you got to see that it was different in another country. Um, And all of you had that experience, which is really, really fun. But you found each other somehow, um, all living in Shanghai, you said. And so when you started doing it, it was just, I mean, I'm sure it came about slowly, but, or did you guys just start asking around your community and then form the company? It first started quite, um, authentically in a way that we just had a group chat. Firstly, it started with the four of us, then we pulled some friends in, um, and then our friends started pulling more friends in. We had a group chat of over 350 women. Oh, nice. um, what, and what year was this? Tell us what year this was. This was 2020. And okay. it was really just a community where we would give each other ideas and nudges of things to try, things we're learning. We started a blog. Um, we didn't have a brand yet at that time. Um, at first we called it nudge because we were nudging one or the, another to learn more about ourselves and our body. And then it was more when we started seeing more and more people coming to ask us about joining the group, um, we realized that there is an opportunity. And that's when we started digging deep into you know market research, um, looking at the business size, looking at the global volume of, you know, people who need to have more pleasurable sex. Yeah. And the four of you probably all had different skills that you could contribute to this venture. Yes, for sure. So I myself, I am branding background. Um, Simona is from a digital marketing background. She is from the Netherlands. She had experiences in Zalando as well. So like e-commerce and startups. Diana is from a media advertising background and Wingsy from a more merchandising and retail background. So the four of us come together quite perfectly to yeah. build a brand. <laughs> Got quite lucky there. No, yeah, that's amazing. And what, from what I understand, you're you're continuing to do a very international, like international approach to running your business, which I really love. And so tell us how that works a little bit before we jump into all your amazing things you're doing now. Yeah, so we decided to expand our business globally, um, partially because, yes, we started the company to help more people like us, as in people who grew up in conservative Asian backgrounds. But as you said, a lot of people have also grown up in conservative backgrounds, um, wherever they are. And I think the topic of pleasure and sex is actually quite the same globally. And we saw that consistency. And so we also then realized, hey, whatever we're building doesn't just work for a city like Shanghai. It also works in the Netherlands, also works in the US. And there are a lot of people 
who find resonance in what we do that we can help. So then we started building a more global portfolio. We deliver globally um, and we have distributors that we work with and I think about 25 to 30 countries now. Wow. And so you realized that your own lived experience was actually more universal than you had originally thought. You thought you guys were the outliers, but actually turned out it was it was just more of a, a, thing, a thing everywhere. Yeah, that's really, really cool. And so when you started, you started as a, as a blog, as a, a community, um, and then expanded into what you are now, which is, would you consider yourself a product company, a wellness company, or both? I would say we are a product company. Um, the main thing we sell, we sell sex toys to intimate care to intimate wear product. So sex toys, massage oil, candles, lubricants, as well as our newest, latest edition is our sex bonbons. They're called the libido sex chocolates. Um, they're a very fun addition to what we do. But on top of that, we also uh, launch weekly educational blogs. We also host a podcast. We have a YouTube where we interview people who are sex, sexual wellness gurus to sex educators. And we also have a community where um, still we have group chats, we have Facebook groups, and we have newsletters that we stay in consistent touch with the people we're in direct contact with and people who have questions to us. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think that you guys are are in a great spot because I feel like we're all collectively learning just how limited the the entire uh, knowledge base of not only women's bodies, to, you know, through medical research and everything, but also women's pleasure is so taboo and so unknown, even to ourselves. And so would you say that as part of your mission is to change that? Definitely, definitely. We're here to break all taboos. <laughs> all taboos yes but it, it for me it's it's incredibly interesting to note just how fast things become taboo um which is if you watch tv maybe in the u.s you think it's different but i think our the, the next generation i hope will not feel like it's such a mystery anymore um, but like you said the orgasm gap between genders was incredibly incredibly just off balance. Um, and we were just learning that in 2020, 2021. Um, oh, no. Yeah. So when you started, um, wh when did you guys start realizing that products would, th th there was obviously a gap in products for this purpose. So tell me about that journey of actually creating products, going from education to making actual products that you obviously were missing in the market. Yeah. So I mentioned previously when we started digging into this area of topic, um, the number of 85% of women don't orgasm during sex, penetrative sex. Um, we also learned that most people, most women orgasm through clitoral stimulation. And when we were in our group chat, we say, hey, you got a massage your clitoris. You got a massage your clitoris. But it's really hard to educate people on just massaging their clitoris without giving them a tool. So then that's when we realized, hey, we should create a tool that we can educate people on how to stimulate and massage their own clitoris and pleasure themselves. And at first we we're like, maybe we should just bring a product from outside and something that we are able to gift our sisters or gift our moms. And when we were shopping around, they were either too expensive, like it feels like some brands or products are gating pleasure. You shouldn't be spending $100 onwards just to enjoy pleasure when it should be given. Um, or products that look a bit tacky and cheap, um, or it feels like it's not really feminine and for us. So we, at that point, we were like, hey, there's, there's space for a brand like ours um, that can be more approachable, beautiful packaging, um, soft, feminine, and not intimidating. Yeah. And that is a big deal because do you think before, I mean, I, I wonder this myself, do you think most of these products were actually created by men, like most products in the world? Um now maybe it's changing, but is that what you were kind of finding? Like this wasn't, you said this wasn't made for us. So do you think maybe that was part of the problem? 
I think the idea it is to make for women, but the approach may be a little bit different.、Um, so what we also did when we started doing product development, visiting factories while we were living in China, it's perfect because I think ninety eight percent of the world's sex toys are made in China. Oh wow.、Um, Yes, I mean China is a great place for manufacturing, and it's、yeah. very, I would say, very advanced in terms of、um, manufacturing. But when we did the visits to a lot of the sex toy factories,、uh, the owners of the factories are men,、um, the 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 R and D designers are men, and there's actually a really funny story. Diana and I visited a factory once, and. The factory owner is so cute. He introduced us to his R and D designer, and his R and D designer just happened to be designing his latest innovation. He thinks all、oh, women will quiver and fall head over heels for. He showed it to us. It was a black, massive swan that looked like plastic vibrating. I don't know what it is. It just looks so intimidating. I looked at it. I was like. Who are you designing this for, and who do you think will like it? He was like, "Oh, I just think women will like it. It looks great, right?" I was like, "Well, you've got two women here. I don't know who else you've asked, but to me, it looks scary." <laughs> yeah. So I think this is also where our brand is a bit different from、um, other brands out there. Is we do work with our group of、um, sex therapists, researchers, as well as direct. Community of women asking them what they want, what they need, and we take that feedback and then reflect it in our product.、Um, versus some other people out there, it could be a layer of gap. Like let's say if it's a male manager asking his female colleague to say, "Why don't you take this toy back home?" and you can report back how we can make this better.、Um, in that case, they're not going to be like it's all wrong. <laughs> Exactly. There's that, and it's also it's a bit strange. It's a bit strange to share such intimate details to, I would say, still to this day, probably to someone of the opposite sex. So I would say, yeah, that's where we stand out quite a lot, and our strong suit is, and yeah, and I also see more and more female sex toy designers that are also rising and growing in the industry, which I find that to be super encouraging and exciting. Yeah, and so tell me. For me, I think you guys are doing something incredible. But also, as a international person, I feel like no matter how well you think you know yourself, when you move internationally to another country, it's a ripe time for self, more self discovery. You can always find out more, change more, and so I really feel like、um, your pleasure, whether that's new foods, new languages. Or your sexual expression; those are really ripe times for to explore. And so, how do you feel like、um, sexual pleasure fits into that matrix of learning more about yourself? That's a very interesting question.、Um, I Why do is it think... important? Like because、yeah. we, we know it's a portal to other parts of your personality,、um, and so I think that. What I, I guess I can reframe the question is: <clears throat> How do you see knowing yourself sexually or your preferences, pleasure-wise, in other parts of your life? How does that manifest in other parts of your life? Would you say? Yeah, I would say it's more the in, well, the, firstly, the international experience、um, for us as four people. I would say we're very shape shifters. We.、Mm -hmm. We 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 wear a lot of different hats, and we almost change who we are in different circumstances. And I think that does contribute to our sexual lives. I would say that is more a contribution to our sexual lives because, just like having sex every day, every experience, every person, every different person you have sex with, you kind of need to also shape shift to to I would say match the other person. So I would say both contribute to one another. Being able to shape shift, shape shift during sex is also a contribution to you know living internationally, meeting different people, knowing how to, you know, observe their physical movements, what their facial expression is, what they're saying, and then shape shift to match that scenario. 
So I do think, yeah, that is a very interesting question, and I've never thought about it like that. But I do think that is a big contribution yeah. to how the four of us become shapeshifters. Yeah, and it's a language in and of itself, right? And so I think, especially dating, if you're in a new city or if you're having these experiences with people, it's really, really important that you know yourself. Um, to be able to fully express or learn something new, and maybe they teach you something new, just like if you were to be in a dance class or something about yourself. They teach you something new about them. But they teach you something new about yourself. I also have noticed that even if you move internationally partnered, you are changing a whole bunch. And、mm -hmm. so, how? I mean, if you're partnered and you are bringing sex toys or new sexual awareness into your relationship, what does your community? Does your community talk about that at all? Yeah.、Um, sorry, can you reframe that question again? Yeah. So if you're single, there, it's a very、yeah. ripe. Like you're always changing with different partners or、yeah. learning new things about yourself. But when partnered, when you're moving、mm -hmm. into a, a new phase of self-expression, which I would say moving to a new country kind of sometimes kicks that off. How do you begin that conversation with if you're partnered? Do you guys have ways that you have people? Introduce this into a couple, or keep it to themselves. Or is there advice you give people if they're partnered and they want to、um, increase their own sexual awareness about themselves without damaging the relationship with their partner? I, I guess.、Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah.、Um, when it comes to that, I really do think it's communication. And I do believe in resetting every few months because we are always changing and we're constantly evolving. And I do think people who are moving internationally evolve, evolve even quicker because you are changing new environments. And with someone that is partnered, being in a new place is actually I find that to be exciting because it's almost like you can redefine who you are. You can you can become a whole new person if you want, and that's a great time to reset yourself sexually as well. Like, hey, you and I we're now let's say we're living in Spain. What is this new thing we want to explore sexually,、yeah. or with one another in the city? And is there other let's say. Parties, people. We also want to involve in our intimate sexual relationship. I think these are all things that,、um, yeah, I think couples could, could, could engage in. It's just have an open dialogue,、uh, reset the goals and reset boundaries, reset what each other are looking for. Yeah, because culturally, you're going into a different culture with different limits, and I think it's actually under.、Um, The many discussions that you have with the partner when you move internationally, I think, is part of my mission because I think people sometimes just dive into the unknown、um, mm -hmm. without agreements financially or sexually, and it leads to quite a bit of friction、um, and unnecessarily because it really is. I feel like, like you said, such a ripe time to be able to become a new version of you or an old version of you or. Become something new, and being partnered maybe shouldn't be、uh, a drag, I guess.、Um, and so I think that sexual expression is a really big one that I think, for me, I see it come out in all areas of life. So if you're able to learn more about yourself this way, both people, or even if you're single, it really bleeds out into other areas of your life.、Um, so 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 very cool.、Um, so now I want to move on to. Um, the like how what was your first product and how did you design it? Yeah, so the first two products we launch are Kits and、um, Pixie. So they're both clitoral toys and a hundred percent focus on the clitoris.、Um, Kit is a bendy rabbit vibrator.、Um, you can choose to insert it into the vagina, but We always say focus on the clitoris first, and only if you want to try inserting, then you can have the choice to with Kit. And Pixie is a 100% clitoral、uh, vibrator, and it's also perfect to use with a partner because it's very thin, it's very small, it doesn't get in the way. Let's say if you're doing partner penetrative sex, or if you're in Um, let's say having sex, a woman having sex with another woman. It's also a great way for you to pleasure one another with it. We've also heard from other women who are in 
uh, lesbian relationships that they will strap it on their knee wearing a pair of socks and then using that as a toy with the partner. So the first two toys are 100% focus focus on uh, female clitoris pleasure. So you went straight to the source. You learned that that most women have success this way and then went straight to that, which is really great. So you designed to that. And then you then have come out with many more products. And so what would you say? So I feel like I know what your guiding principle is, women's pleasure, yes. <laughs> um, which I love. And how do you think that is changing the world? What do you see as the effect of focusing on women's pleasure so much? Definitely. Um, this topic gets me really excited because we do feel like once a woman understands how she can pleasure herself, it contributes to so many other things. Uh, firstly, if she is in a relationship, it contributes a lot to a relationship, a couple, because you're more confident with how you know how you enjoy pleasure. Then you can then openly communicate how you can, how your partner can help pleasure you. Um, so I think that's number one. And number two is self-pleasure is just great because it does help with overall mood, overall feeling sexiness, confidence. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And so when women know their own bodies and their own wants and desires, it contributes to their whole life, um, partnered or not, is what I hear you saying. Definitely. Um, and so then when you, I love that you guys um, contribute telling, I want to hear about free a girl. So when someone makes a purchase with the O collective or I, how does it work? Tell me about free a girl first and then yeah. tell me how it works. So firstly, how we picked free a girl. So we also, we had a poll on one of our newsletters as well as on social media, asking our community, um, for cause that we should contribute to. Um, and that was one of the causes that we have firstly picked, but then our community then vouched for that community to, for us to contribute a portion of our sales to. So for every sale that, um, is purchased, we contribute 1% of our profit towards Free Your Girl. And at the end of every quarter, we just make a massive donation to them. Nice. And tell us why you chose that one. Tell us what drew you to that, um, call or organization cause what would you call it um i would say it's both um it's helping young women um keep them safe from sexual abuse and so this really is resonant with what you're doing right so keeping women or girls from being um violently using used for usually men's pleasure um, so that that really resonates with your cause and it's actually balanced, which is really cool with what you're, you guys are doing. So I want to get into a little bit um, where you see this going, like wh- what's what's the big vision for the O Collective is already big. But what is what is the I love to ask people about their grand visions. So if you I know your other three partners aren't here, but if you could Show us what the O Collective will be like in 10 or 20 years. What what would you say? We want to help women at every stage of their life cycle, bring them pleasure at every stage. Um, I think right now we are serving a specific, more of a specific stage of women. But I mean, women go through so many stages. Right now we're serving a woman who is just learning about her pleasure, uh, beginning in this journey, being in a relationship, probably a younger relationship. Um, those are the women we're serving at the moment. But we also see, hey, there is premenopausal, postmenopausal, um, people, uh, women that are of, let's say, 60, 70 years old that we can also serve. But at the moment, uh, we are serving a spe- specific segment, but we hope in the future that we have the right products to help them at every stage of their life cycle. Yeah, and it sounds like that starts with conversations um, for you for you guys. And so how has, I, I really love the approach of leading with community, like really having your community. How has that been, how has that been unexpected for you guys, if it has been, in building a brand and a company with community being a big part of it? Hmm. Uh, just how much women want to be a part of this. And... 
and how much people when women get together, uh, there is a strength in us that we're more unafraid to speak about what we think. Um, so I do think that when you have a community of women coming together to speak about the topic of sex, sexual pleasure, how we can make it better, um, I do think that's a very strong, tight knit place to be, and it's truly beautiful. Like I, I honestly love just getting women together, doing events, having talks, or even just asking one another questions and having one another share their personal point of view, because when it comes to sex, it's not. It's not just one way, and it's right. Everyone is different, and by hearing all these different stories, different point of views, different perspectives, you can also feel less alone.、Um, one of our segment that we do in our blog, as well as our podcast, is called "Just Like You."、Um, we started that because it was actually quite also natural. It was. The four of us were discussing about a topic of HPV, and we separately all had HPV, but different strains. And we thought we were individually all thought we were dying. <laughs> and it was only until we—I know, right? It was、yeah. only until we spoke about it to one another. We we're like, "Oh, we all have it." Oh, so what? What was your journey like? And then you feel a lot better once you you hear that you're on the same journey another person is on as well. And just like sex, you know, whether it's good sex, bad sex, sex we want to get better at, a bad partner or a good partner, hearing these different experiences can all make us feel less alone. And I think that's where our community contributes to that. Right. It reminds me, and maybe maybe it's just because of my age, but it reminds me a little bit, and it's not the same. But when Me Too happened. Um, mm. And everybody thought that they were having their own experience、yeah. until women started speaking to other women, and then it became, I would say, a global phenomenon. Would you say? Like,、yeah. I was in the U.S. at the time, but like, I feel like around the world, women started going, "Oh, me too, me too." Oh, I thought I was alone,、yeah. um, or I was, I was the cause of this, or something was wrong with me.、Um, and there was incredible.、Um, It was just incredible. We had never spoken about it between women.、Yeah. You just there was a shame or something,、um, and so I really feel like you guys are doing. It's the same energy you're talking about, talking about pleasure, education, experience, you know, problems or scary things as well. The entire、yeah. experience of being a woman、um, and parts of your body that are not often spoke about、um, in、yeah. public.、Um, And that really does change the world, and so I, I commend you on on that because I think pleasure can be a hot button topic, but so can、um, pain or or things that are hard. And so I think that you're right, women. And why do you think? Do you think when I think back to why I didn't mention to anybody about my own experience? For me, it was it just wasn't. There was no language. There was no forum. There was no. It didn't even occur to me to talk to somebody about this. Would you say that was the same for you growing up, the way you did and where you did? I think a big part of it probably was shame,、mm -hmm. and we recently ran a campaign. It was a partnership with Mubi on a movie called How to Have Sex, and I feel like I'm very open when it comes to the dialogue, talking about sex or problems that I have, issues that I've experienced, bad experiences that I had. But from the movie How to Have Sex. The whole thing they were talking about was consent, and the first time a woman engages in, let's say, sex when she's starting out, and I, I realized I never spoke to anyone about my first time experiencing or engaging in some form of sexual act, and I realized I kept quiet the entire time because I don't know how to express that feeling with other people. I always just felt like, oh, it was probably only me, and oh, it was me because I never said no. It was me because I just laid there and let him kiss me, for example. But until I watched that movie, and then we shared it on social, we spoke about consent. Then we had people also sharing, oh, I wish I've said something different, or I wish I knew I had the right language to to, to express myself. So、yeah. I do think it is knowing that you can. Talk about it, and knowing how you can talk about it、um, is very, very important. And I hope we can 
help to educate more people that are younger than us that they are they they have the voice and they should use their voice. And likewise, for other people is to ask other people for their consent and ask. And it's not just about always. Oh, I need to voice out, but also other people to be aware of how we feel as well. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree with that because I think it's been an entire decade or more of just asking women to yeah. be more vocal and know their needs. And we've done that. We've done that work. I think, and even with kids, teaching them about owning their, you know, that they're, they're the owner of their bodies. But I would say the next frontier is. I, I, you know, we've taught an entire generation of women or more to know their needs and wants and desires and how to say no. But now getting the people that we're partnered with to actually listen to our voices, I feel like is the next frontier because we can say no all we want. Yeah. And we know very well that it might not matter. And, um, and for me, that's, that's the next frontier. And so do you have, I, mean, I know you said you just did a campaign around this, and I think it pertains to coupled or not coupled tools or things for people that are not women to engage with consent, pleasure, or is that outside of your mission, which is totally fine. Definitely. We also just launched a blog. It's also about consent, mm-hmm. um, and it is about obtaining consent and giving consent. Um, so obtaining consent is normally would be from you can be a man, a woman, uh, or whatever, and you can be asking a partner or someone in a relationship how you want to obtain obtain sex with them. And then um, giving consent is how do you give verbal affirmation that whichever partner you're with, what they're doing is what you like. Um, So we have launched a blog, and I think it works with both genders. um, And you can use that as a resource to kind of get yourself started um, in the journey of consent. Yeah, nice. And since this is a worldwide phenomenon, I feel like this knowing how, where do you think it stems from? Do you think it stems really from, I mean, cultures worldwide have this problem. It's not a a Asian problem or an American problem or a European problem. Where do you think it comes from? I think it does come from there's definitely more female independence, emancipation of the female gender. And I do think that contributes a lot to us having more of a voice um, and us being able to voice out what we truly want and demand for it. And now we just don't, we don't just have to protect ourselves. We have to demand other people to do it with us as well. And I do think, yeah, that is, a global phenomenon I see changing and the narrative is changing. I think media is a big contributor to it and more and more people being able to share their personal voices is a contributor to it as well. Yeah. And so, and I want to ask you the next question, which is what I found in my own work um, with talking about finances and value Mm -hmm. within a couple. Do you, I have found what I didn't realize is there's more, chance of violence when talking about these things, which I don't want to scare people. It's not very sexy to think about violence, but have you, what I'm working on right now, and maybe this is why I'm asking you, is ways we can bring this up because we have, we are mad about this. We are angry about this within our own lives and for the world. Um, and, but we still, when we're in these situations where we may be more vulnerable, um, is there thoughts around this? I, I'm really asking you as a thought leader, if what you're considering around this, because for me, I'm now going back and considering my approach, how to structurally change making women so vulnerable, but also if they're in a situation, how to maybe employ other things to get my way. The anger drives it, but how can we then implement it in a way that's maybe safer? Is there any thoughts around this you guys have. I know it's not very sexy and it's not very fun, but I think it's something we deal with as women. Hmm. So if I can understand that question correctly is how do we approach situations such as talking about our pleasure, what we want, because we know it's very, it can be, we hope the world's changing and it is, but it can be really threatening to talk about these things still, especially with people who may have different thoughts or grown up differently, or maybe aren't doing as much research as we are. 
about pleasure yeah. and about women's bodies. Yeah. Oh, you mean violence coming from other people or from ourselves? Yes. From other people. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like the your other half maybe not receiving um, the question or the statement or the request as yeah. kindly as you wished. Yeah. Um, hmm, that is a tough question, but and I think it really varies from relationship to relationship. But what I'm also seeing is using forms of media perhaps could help as an open as as a way to open the dialogue because you're not involved, but you're using media as a way in to see how they are able to uh, be receptive to a certain message you want to get to. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned this actually from a friend who is who comes from a very, very, very traditional background, mm -hmm. um, religious uh, from the Middle East, and the family was very against homosexuals. And it was after, I would say, firstly, their nation started opening up about homosexuals and the whole ideas of it, and him showing his family what that could also be in different forms of media. His family actually became more and more open-minded through time. It took him two decades to get there, but now he finally opened up to his family that he is gay. And 20 years ago, I remember when his he told me, he said, my brother told me he would, my dad told me he would disown me if let's say I turned out to be gay. So, okay, that is a form of violence in a certain way. Um, and of course, everyone's circumstances are very different. But if I were to approach this situation, I would firstly just slowly nudge them in kind of a direction that I'm looking to get to um, and then see how they receive these information. And, and if not, I would then probably seek help like a third party help whether it is a sex therapist or a psychiatrist or a psychologist um or even just joining different workshops if that's an easier in um to kind of nudge them in the right way um and also slowly opening them up to these different i guess environments and once they become more and more accustomed to these environments that you want to guide them to, um, I think they they will start probably be more primed and start changing their perspectives on things that it's not so weird and it's not so scary. Yeah. And lastly, I do also think there is a beauty in when you're communicate when you're communicating with someone that may not receive your information as kindly as you want them. A written note can be quite a good way because they don't have to look at your face. They don't have to look at your reaction. They don't have to feel vulnerable while you're there. A written note is a great way for them to be vulnerable in their own times, as well as have time to think about it versus being very reactive. And, and then maybe then you get into an argument and then something bad could happen. Yeah. And I think that for me, what I've noticed is that it's really important that you start with, I want to do this with you. <laughs> this does not mean I'm leaving you. If I want to change the way our finances are done or maybe the way yeah. pleasure works within our relationship. And so that that I would just add to what you've said. I love the note. I think that's really nice. That, I love um, what you also just said, because it's not that you're not doing this for me. I think that's so important. It is, I would like this from you and... But it's not something to put them down. It's to let them know what you want. Yeah, I think that's so important. Yeah, it's adding on. It's in addition to what we already have, which is great. But because I do think, especially, I, I think when you're single, it's also super important to know yourself and your body. But for me, it's a mission to not stop doing that throughout my life. And I think for most women, we don't want to stop growing and learning just because we're partnered. And so I think that if you weren't able to have that conversation because you're, you know, my age or older um, and you, you do love your partner dearly, but you don't want to hold your own progress back. These are important things that I think are, are really rich to discuss. Um, yeah. 
So now I want to move on to education and how the next generation, how we're teaching our girls and our boys about consent, but also the differences in education you see between countries or how it's different. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So I grew up in Taiwan and in Taiwan, I would say in terms of sex education in school, it's close to zero, Mm -hmm. even to this day. And a lot of times when people learn about sex is actually through forms of media that perhaps is not the most helpful. Um, I also went to school in Canada. Um, So there is there is classes, like one or two classes when you're middle school, high school, where they teach you how to put on a condom over a banana, um, how, why you shouldn't get pregnant, how it's dangerous. Um, so there's that. In the Netherlands, so this is where our business is right now. Um, from what I hear from Simona and Winksy is that when they grew up, they actually feel like there's a lot more resources than, you know, those two other places I've just explained. Um, She mentioned that in schools, um, there's one or two more courses. And I think in the recent years, there are organizations that are also offering schools more in-depth education about sex. That's not just about the biology of sex. That's more about the pleasure of sex, consent. Um, And it's more well-rounded. Um, so I think there are more, more and more organizations like this, but still it's not a program that has been adapted nationwide just yet. But I do see that there are more resources, let's say in the UK or Europe, um, when it comes to sex education, I think there are other places in the world that still needs catching up and adapting to new ways of educating when it comes to sex ed. Yeah. And so do you think that because it's left to the individual to teach within the family, within the friend group, mother to daughter, if you're talking about um, in families, usually, I mean, it's I think it's usual that you learn about your own body from your same sex parent most of the time by by educating women who are adults already. Do you feel that you have resources or do you direct them to resources that they can then as they're educating themselves, of course they're passing it on, but are there resources that you give to your community that maybe help them talk to their kids about pleasure and not just like you said, the biology and the scariness of these parts of their bodies. Do you have resources you recommend or how do you approach this? Yeah, definitely. Um, For example, in the UK um, there's a website called Brooks Um, And Brooks works with a lot of universities and schools on what are the steps and tools to educate younger kids. And Brooks is a great way to give you a framework on how you can speak to kids about sex in a more well-rounded way. That's not just about the biology. It's about communication as well, pleasure and more. Um, So I would say check that out. Um, in the Netherlands, I believe there's platforms like Rokers. Um, I can share those later on in a link and you can we'll share them. Yeah, we'll share them in the show notes. That'd be great. On. Yeah. And so there's platforms doing it. Um, and yes. so so when we talk to our girls or what, what I found myself is as I change, I immediately translate it to my kids and think, oh, this is what I've done wrong or this is where there's gaps. Um but I really feel like when you're what the work you're doing will affect by proxy the yeah. sons and daughters of the women. Um, but it can be tricky. And so do you think in school, because we don't learn about finances, we don't learn about pleasure, we don't learn about emotional intelligence in schools. Do you think there's a place for, which I think you're trying to provide, community to maybe provide not not just a framework but also resources that way of like parenting guides or things like this um about pleasure because really pleasure is such a human thing yeah and it ties into everything yeah yeah i definitely do think so I mean, ideally, we we hope we can learn this from school, right? Because how much of what we actually learned in school are we using right now in our everyday lives? 
like like you said, finances, accounting, that are we're probably doing oftentimes right now, doing taxes, paying the bills, or how to fix the house, or how to self pleasure. These are everyday things that I think we should probably learn more in, like twelve years of education we get,、um, but we don't.、Um, so yeah, unfortunately, it is left. Like a lot of responsibility has now been put on to, let's say, a parent or an organization or a coach, which then you have to pay money to help support you.、Yeah. But I also do find that, of course, if you're careful enough, there are resources online, whether it's YouTube videos, you finding trusted sources from organizations to individual people that are sharing their knowledge is also very. Great way to learn too. Yeah, and what I've noticed is an uptick in、um, also male pleasure. You know, it, it's a big topic: male pleasure, male power. Ma- where do I fit into the world? So, how do you vet? And this is a big question, so it's okay. How would you suggest people vet the sources they want to learn more about this for kids or for themselves? If it's not the O Collective, how do you? What are the guiding principles of if you want to pleasure first or have pleasure be part of? Your paradigm when it comes to your body and your life. Yeah, yeah. Well, me personally, I normally find whether it's brand or 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 individuals.、Um, if I'm looking for resources, who has spoken about them?、Mm-hmm. Um, that for me is important because who who's spoken about them can give you another trusted stamp on hey, this person is trustworthy.、Mm-hmm. But when it comes to product, are they certified? Are they safe? Or are they just some plastic that could cause cancer, for example? So I think there are different steps and different stamps of approval that、um, can help you validate: Oh, is this person suitable or right for me to follow? Are they gonna give me bad suggestions and、yeah. bad guidance that's gonna lead me down the wrong way? And we definitely have seen people that have gone down the wrong route and have. Built probably more extreme point of view about a certain topic, but again, I also find it to be quite beautiful. The internet that anyone can find what they like,、um, and they、yeah. can also find their niche. I tend to see the, the internet as a beautiful place too.、Um, <laughs> but so, tell me about the certification really quick. I know we don't have much time left, but can people look for a certification, and what does it mean for products for for、uh, products like this? Yeah. So when it comes to sex toy product, for example, it's still quite unregulated. It's not like FDA or like it's not. Yeah, it's not like as strict as that.、Um, but I would say in the Netherlands,、um, in the UK, or in the US,、um, there are nations that are, and platforms that are becoming stricter and stricter on. Hey, what are the certifications you need to ensure you upload? Then you can sell on a certain platform, and.、Um, Yeah, I think those are like I would say just like the initial checks you need to go through, like a CE and and FDA or or.、Um, and this is just about safety, right? So like what you put on your skin,、um, yeah. what you put in your body, it's being more regulated, you would say. And there's a certification that ensures that it's safe. Yeah, and is it food grade? Is it medical grade material? I think these are all things that you can tick off when you're searching for products. It reminds me of when I had babies and I went all glass bottles because of the plastic wasn't safe. <laughs> reminds、yeah. me of that. So you feel like that's coming along, and is that is that recent? Yes, definitely. I would say it's in the recent maybe two years that people are becoming more aware of it.、Um, but of course, there are still people who are opting for the cheapest item out there that may not care so much about the product. But yeah, it's also just a reminder that. Um, it is a very intimate product, and you should care about the material, and you should care about the certifications that comes with it. Yeah, keep yourself safe. Keep yourself safe. Okay, so I want to tell everyone where they can find you, how they can join the conversation. Can you give us all of the details of how to connect more with the O Collective? Yes,、uh, you can connect with the O Collective through at the O Collective. T H E O H C L. C O L L E C T I V E on Instagram as well as TikTok, and you can find us and follow our newsletter through our website. 
And yeah, we hope you can come and say hi. And you guys do events too sometimes in real life events. Yes, we do. So look out for events、um, that we will host across Amsterdam this summer. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your time and letting me ask you all these big questions. I really think you guys are a thought leader in the space, and I appreciate what you're bringing to the world. So thanks for bringing it to House of Peregrine. Thank you so much for having us.